Well, for nearly four decades, the Grady College has welcomed significant figures in journalism to the University of Georgia to help us honor Ralph McGill's courage as an editor. McGill was regarded as the conscience of the South for his editorials challenging racial segregation in the 1950s and 1960s. In 2007, we added the McGill Symposium, bringing together students, faculty, and leading journalists to consider what journalistic courage means and how it is exemplified by reporters and editors. Earlier today, leading journalists from across the country joined our 12 McGill Fellows, undergraduate and graduate students selected by a faculty committee for their strengths in academics, practical experience, and leadership, who you will meet in a few moments, for the 10th annual McGill Symposium. Our five visiting journalists were Grady alum Greg Bluestein, political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, and Mary Catherine Hamm, also a Grady alum, uh, CNN contributor and senior writer at The Federalist, New York Times assistant editor Walt Bogdanovich, and Louis Palou, an award-winning photojournalist and documentary filmmaker, and Carrie Seidman, a columnist for the Sarasota Herald Tribune. In 2009, we expanded the program yet again when we awarded the first McGill Medal to a U.S. journalist whose career has exemplified journalistic courage. The 2016 McGill Medal was awarded to Jason Razan of the Washington Post. Today marks the 38th McGill Lecture. The McGill Fellows, this year's class, most of whom are with us today, will select the next McGill Medal recipient based on nominations submitted by journalists and journalism educators from throughout the country. Let me introduce this year's class of McGill Fellows. McGill Fellows, please come forward and receive your graduation honor cord. Lee Benson. Corey Cole. Elizabeth Fike, Erica Hensley, Jordan Hill, Joshua Jones, Jalen Thompson, Caitlin Umholtz. Four McGill Fellows cannot be with us. They were with us earlier, but they are on their way to their next Grady provided opportunity. They are headed to New York to spend the weekend as Cox Sabu Fellows at the National Convention of the Society of American Business Editors and Writers. Um, we'll see them actually on Saturday because we have an alumni event in New York as well. They are Michelle Baruchman, Lauren Herbert, William Robinson, and Caitlin Yarborough. We also would like to thank members of the journalism faculty who've given generously of their time this year to help the McGill program succeed. Thanks to Valerie Boyd, Keith Herndon, Barry Hollander, Janice Hume, Mark Johnson, Diane Murray, of course, and finally, Pat Thomas, who will now introduce our McGill lecture. Pat. What a, great, uh, what a great day we've had. I'm going to have to, uh, the tall guy follows me. I, I'll just have to stand on tiptoes here. What a great day we've had today. And uh, I'm very thrilled to introduce our, our guest speaker, David Armstrong, um, who is a fabulous investigative reporter. Now, I first became aware of David Armstrong in 19... 94. I lived in Boston at the time, and he won a couple of national prizes for a series that he did about unsafe elevators in Boston. And what he was really writing about was the lax habits of elevator inspectors who were supposed to be looking out for things like fraying cables that might imperil our lives, but who were really doing detailed examinations of the glazed donuts at uh, Dunkin' Donuts and uh, I think shopping at some big box stores uh, as well. So fast forward to 2015 when David became the lead investigative reporter for STAT, which I hope all of you have heard up. To me, it's the most important journalism startup of uh, the teens. I guess that's our decade now. It covers science, health, and medicine. 
Um, here, he and, vid and the videographer, Matthew Orr, have produced some really extraordinary uh, packages. Uh, the one thing that I've noticed going back and rereading some of his work, uh, oddly enough, is that they remind me a little bit of the Book of Revelations. Uh, not because he writes apocalyptic prophecies and there are no seven-headed beasts that I have found, but because his stories delve into the ongoing struggle between good and evil, which happens both within us and outside us. And the best of his work hits me a little bit like Greek tragedy or grand opera. Uh, take Dope Sick, uh, the multimedia package that ran on stat in August. The central characters are two young men in Ohio, best friends who really mean one another no harm, who are surrounded by people who love them and want to save them from themselves. But they are opioid addicts, and of course, there is harm. More recently, he's been examining the opioid crisis from another angle. He's been digging deep into the falsehoods that two major pharmaceutical companies promulgated in order to make OxyContin the most popular painkiller in the marketplace. Again, his work is a revelation. So let's hear from David Armstrong. Thank you, Pat. Can, can everybody hear me OK? OK. Um, I do have a mic on, so if you can't hear me, just raise your hand. I'm ready to go. Um, uh, that was a very kind introduction. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, it's certainly an honor to be here today and deliver the McGill Lecture. When Pat and Diane first approached me about giving this talk, I'll admit to a little bit of hesitancy in accepting. To state the obvious, this is a tumultuous time in journalism. The invitation to speak today included the offer for me to come and inspire, this is a direct quote, or possibly horrify, the next generation of reporters. Conventional wisdom is a somber one when it comes to the future of investigative journalism. Today I'll share some visions of investigative journalism, past, present, and future, and provide you with an alternative narrative for the future of investigative journalism that I hope is convincing. It's certainly a privilege to speak in an event associated with Ralph McGill, who remains an inspiration for investigative reporters decades after he wrote his last story. He was a relentless critic of the failures of segregation in the 1930s South. He wrote about the inequity between the educations provided at white and black schools, a subject that incredibly remains an issue in this country today. One of the very best pieces of investigative journalism last year came from the Tampa Bay Times. It was a stunning expose of racial segregation in the Pinellas County schools and the shockingly inadequate education received by students at overwhelmingly black elementary schools. If you need inspiration in considering a career in investigative journalism or seek evidence that this kind of reporting is still desperately needed in this country, read that series. Ralph McGill was a man of guts and integrity, willing to make readers uncomfortable and angry. When he became editor of the Constitution, the Atlanta chapter of the KKK paraded around the newspaper building in protest. I often ask student journalists and younger colleagues about the reaction their stories are getting. And I often hear responses like, well, no one's complaining. And I say, damn, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, Ralph McGill was inundated with obscene phone calls to his home, death threats, and on occasion people would dump loads of garbage in his front lawn. I say if you wake up after running a story and find piles of garbage in your lawn, you've done something right. Surely Ralph McGill's courage cost his newspaper some readers, but there's a lesson for us today. Ralph McGill's provocative and fearless writings attracted new readers and a national audience. His column was syndicated and widely read. He had the courage of his conviction, and ultimately that turned out to be good for business. I'm also humbled to follow the journalists who have delivered this lecture in the past, so many of whom are courageous figures in their own right. I had the privilege of working for Paul Steiger when he was the editor of the Wall Street Journal. And then there's Catherine Graham, who was publisher of the Washington Post, helped define the meaning of journalistic courage when she both spurred on and backed her editor 
Ben Bradley and his reporters when they tackled Watergate. I was fortunate to have Ben Bradley's son, Ben Jr., as my editor at the Boston Globe, and he was a terrific investigative editor in his own right. In the journalism world, I was a Watergate baby. I grew up in a house where multiple newspapers were delivered each day, the news weeklies came in the mail each week, and the nightly network news was required viewing. As a young boy, I was transfixed by the Watergate scandal. What enthralled me was the notion that two journalists could change the course of history simply by doing their job and revealing the truth. And it looked like a lot of fun. There's a reason journalism is romanticized in film and TV. And I was hooked, and I never wanted to do anything else. My first real job was delivering the Boston Globe, and it was a thrill years later to walk into that newsroom as a reporter. So I fixed from an early age on becoming a journalist, and not only that, but an investigative journalist. I got my first real taste of what that meant when I was an intern in college at the Syracuse Herald Journal. It was an afternoon paper. Yes, we used to have those. Um, and in fact, no longer exists. Um, at the time, had a bigger circulation than the morning paper. And the two papers, even though they were jointly owned, had separate newsrooms and they waged war every day. And the city was better for it. I mostly worked nights and would be sent off to a school board meeting or a shooting or some other incident. And it was at one of those meetings that I met a union official. We had a nice conversation and a few days later he called me in the newsroom because of course we didn't have cell phones back then. Um, and it was the union guy saying, hey, I've got a scoop for you. He said, how would you like the details on a big scandal involving no-show jobs at the city public works department? I said, that sounded great. And we made plans to meet later to get all the details and I hung up the phone and I sat at my desk for a minute and I realized I had no idea what a no-show job was. <laughs> I just knew by the way, way the guy said it, it was something really bad. So then I went running to my editor to tell him the great news and not letting on that I had no idea what I was talking about. Um, thankfully, they paired me with a senior reporter who became a mentor. And I learned that a no-show job was one where you got paid for the job but didn't actually have to show up for it, thus no-show. And we spent weeks following these no-show job holders around to confirm they weren't working and coordinating our actions on walkie-talkies and generally having a great time even when we got up at 5 a.m. to chase some of these folks around. And we ended up with a story splashed across the top of the front page. People were fired, reforms were put in place, and older colleagues patted me on the back and it was just intoxicating and I never wanted to do anything else after that. And it's easy to be nostalgic for those earlier days. Um, journalism jobs have been in decline. There's uncertainty and a, a fair amount of desperation <coughs> among legacy media and even shiny new entities that are trying to figure out how to make money in this environment of the internet and social media and smartphones and the general expectation that what we produce should be delivered instantly and for free. And while newspapers of the past were certainly flawed, they were also magical places flush with cash from monopolistic strangleholds over classified auto and real estate ads, as well as huge and lucrative full display ads from department stores, banks, and all sorts of other places. These were newsrooms of almost unlimited possibilities. Even mid-sized dailies had Washington and foreign bureaus. There were full-time critics for theater, movies, architecture, uh, literature, television, art, you name it. There were national rec reporters, there were uh, dedicated sections for the arts and opinion and business and all sorts of other things. And the best newspapers devoted significant resources to investigative reporting. So then, what about the future of investigative journalism? Well, for what it's worth, here's what Wikipedia thinks about investigative journalism. And I'll quote, because of its high cost and inherently confrontational nature, this kind of reporting is often the first to suffer from budget cutbacks or interference from outside the news department. Investigative reporting done poorly can also expose journalists and media organizations to negative reaction from subjects of investigations and the public and accusations of gotcha journalism, end quote. Not very encouraging. But hey, it's Wikipedia, so we have that going for us. <coughs> Some have gone as far as imagining the future for us, the future of investigative journalism in particular, 
And I'd like to show you one such vision. Um, and, and I suspect some of you may have already seen this, um, but I've watched it 10 times and, and still find it entertaining. And for the rest of you, I'm giving you fair warning, it's scary. So let me show you that. Um, so that is courtesy of, um, oops, let me get rid of that and that. Um, courtesy of John Oliver. Um, it's brilliant, hilarious, and depressing at the same time. And, and by the way, there's fewer, fewer um, greater champions of investigative reporting than John Oliver if we, we could use a lot more of his passion in defending the kind of work we do. So is this the future? I'm here to tell you the answer is no. Because guess what? Investigative journalism is valued. And any time a product is valued, there's almost always a way to monetize it. We're figuring that last part out, and hopefully we'll get to answers we need sooner rather than later, but I believe it will happen. I just don't ex know exactly when and precisely what those business models will look like. It may also not be universal. Figuring out how to fund this kind of work in smaller cities and urban and rural areas will likely be more difficult, just as those areas have been disproportionately hit by the overall loss of journalism jobs. And I'm also not naive or Pollyannish about this. It will be challenging to sustain and pay for investigative journalism in the future. And there have already been plenty of failed ideas, business models, and strategies. Last year, after two decades at large media organizations like the Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg, I decided to work for a startup media organization that Pat mentioned earlier called STAT. And we're a digital publication focused on medicine, health, and science. And for me, it's a chance to experience this new media ecosystem at a granular level. At STAT, we measure everything. We know what people read, how long they read it, how they find our stories. And we do this not to determine what to write about, but to understand our audience. In fact, reporters do not have access to metrics. Um, and by the way, let me apologize in advance here for the repeated use of the word metrics. I hate it, but I couldn't figure out a better word. Um, <coughs> we only hear about these numbers indirectly at times from editors who are thrilled by the response to a particular story or will have company-wide meetings and updates on how the business is going. But an, an editor has never come to me and said, well, I think this is a great story or topic idea because it's going to boost our metrics. At the same time, our goal is to build an audience and to engage with that audience. And the existence of these metrics can be unsettling for someone like me because I, I assumed incorrectly, it turns out, that every subscriber to the publication I was writing for at that particular moment took the time and maintained the interest to read each of my stories from top to bottom. I was so thrilled to work at the Wall Street Journal with two million readers thinking, wow, that's a lot of people that are going to read me every day. And now thanks to technology, I know a lot of people don't even read the first word of my story. Uh, or click on the link at all. Um, but here's what I do know, and here's what we know after just under a year of publishing STAT. Readers love investigative reporting. They thirst for original, explanatory, and long-form stories. They have a huge appetite for the stories we do that challenge conventional wisdom, including a number of our reporters who do a, a beautiful job of deconstructing high-profile studies and exposing truths about them. And that melds nicely with our journalistic mission, which is to differentiate ourselves from much of the other reporting in these subject areas. And a big part of this is investigative reporting. One of the first significant decisions we had to make was whether or not to engage in an expensive legal fight to try and unseal court records in Kentucky. We pitched the idea to our owner, and he didn't hesitate. He said, that's exactly the kind of journalism we should be doing. So we, we launched the legal fight. And we won, uh, with a judge ordering the release of sealed records related to the marketing of the painkiller OxyContin. Now, those particular documents um, also contain a deposition of a member of the family that controls and owns the company that produces OxyContin. And it's the only deposition we're aware of that's ever been taken of a family member. And this family's made billions of dollars off this drug. Um, we don't have the documents yet because the company's appeal, but we've already been rewarded by our decision by intense reader interest and in, in overwhelmingly, uh, overwhelming support for our effort. In our first nine months, starting from a blank slate and zero readers, we hit uh, nearly three million page views for the month of August. 
a million and a half of those were are unique visits. And now there's only so much you can learn from numbers like those, and you can also read plenty of critiques about measuring web traffic. But remember, I told you we measure more than that. Um, Pat told you about this, the, ser the story we did, Dope Sick, in August. It's an 8,000 word story on two friends from Ohio who became hooked on opioids and accidentally found their way to fentanyl, which, by the way, is ravaging this country. And they encountered fentanyl in a way that was devastating and both unexpected in terms of the results. Readers not only opened that story in large numbers, they actually read it. The average reader spent seven minutes with the story, and many of them returned to it later to finish it. That's an extraordinary amount of time spent on a single story. Even for the most highly trafficked stories, readers most often click in to read the first couple paragraphs and stay for about 15 seconds. So when you can engage readers, you can create value. Um, another one of our most read stories is an investigation by my colleague Charlie Piller. He spent weeks looking at the secretive Google health healthcare startup called Verily. And he uncovered the fact that many of the top talents at that company were leaving the promising startup, um, largely a result of a um, divisive CEO. And for another story, Charlie worked for months with our in-house data expert. Um, who wrote custom code to scrub the National Institutes of Health website to find out if federal agencies, universities, and hospitals, and others were reporting the results of clinical trials as they're required to do. And it turns out most were not. In, in fact, the top recipients of NIH money were not reporting their trial results as they should. And that story um, actually elicited some commentary from Joe Biden that was totally unsolicited. And the NIH itself, which has now uh, put in some reforms and um, tougher rules uh, about reporting those results. And, and both of those stories just had unbelievably great reader traffic and engagement. And what we're with witnessing at STAT is not unique. In a recent report based on original research, the American Press Institute said the single biggest change publishers can make in general is to produce more high-value high major enterprise journalism. The APA found that major enterprise stories score 48% better than others in the measure of overall engagement. Um, I won't bore you with the detail, details on how they measure that, but it includes things like how long people read the stories. Um, and these major enterprise stories also generate more page views, more sharing on social media, um, and, and other metrics as well. They also found that people like long stories. They concluded that, quote, the conventional wisdom that writing for the web needs to be short and fast is simply not true. Long form stories, which they defined as averaging 1,200 words, drove 23% more engagement and lifted other metrics such as page views. Now with all this talk of metrics, let me offer you someone who puts all this in plainer language, more in sync with the vernacular of a newsroom. So um, I'm going to utter a few curse words, and you can edit it out of the tape if you want. Um, but this comes from Josh Topolsky, who has been involved in the founding of several digital news entities. He's launching another one right now. And he explains what we are seeing with reader interest in investigative and long-form journalism this way. He says, audience don't want your cheap shit. They want the good shit. And they will go to find it somewhere. Hell, they'll even pay for it. What will save the media industry, or at least the part worth saving, is when we start making real things for people again, instead of programming for algorithms or new things. Does that mean great investigative work will attract more readers than news of, sad news of Angelina and Brad's split? Um, probably not, but might it attract enough of the right readers, ones who will pay for and engage with what we do? And there's ample evidence that it will. Um, consider Blendle. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's a new online news platform that offers articles from a variety of newspapers and magazines, some of the, the best and largest in this country and elsewhere, and sells them on a pay-per-article basis. So you have to pay. And what are people buying? The head of the company's US cur uh, curation team says the most popular articles uh, tend to be longer feature writing and analysis as opposed to straight news. Every one of the top 10 most bought stories had some element of analysis, investigation, opinion, or unique feature writing. Blendle's curator put it this way, 
Users are putting their hands in their virtual pockets one story at a time to support original, probing, insightful journalism. And there's something else going on at the same time. We have never had more tools available to us as investigative reporters, both in terms of how we report the stories and how we tell them. For many of our investigative stories at STAT, we create trailers for social media. And this helps to create interest in the upcoming pieces. The most successful one we did was viewed over one million times on Facebook. It was a story about how college football players who are medically disqualified from playing at one school because of repeat concussions were being recruited to play at other universities because, believe it or not, the NCAA does not prohibit this. So the trailer for this was just 29 seconds long, but as I mentioned, it prompted so many people to come and read the story, and I thought I'd just show that to you real quick since it's only 29 seconds. Um, for the story of the two friends in Ohio, we actually did several different trailers in this um, vein. And um, uh, Pat was nice enough to mention Matt Orr at the beginning is a really incredibly talented multimedia journalist um, who I won't do anything without working now. Um, and so he's created most of these. And um, let me just show you that one um, quickly as well. Dope Sick was exciting, obviously a tragic story, but exciting in a journalistic <coughs> sense to those of us who worked on it because it, it blended the best of traditional investigative reporting with many of the new tools at our disposal. We came to the story after the most pivotal event occurred, and that was the death of DJ Shanks. Yet we were able to vividly describe his heartbreaking and dramatic death, thanks to a combination of these tools. We obtained surveillance footage of the fateful drug transaction that led to DJ dying at his job at Tim Hortons as well as the haunting footage of his actual death when he slowly passes out on top of a glaze machine at his workplace. We were able to get a hold of DJ's diary and add his voice to the story. Um, we acquired the police body camera and dash cam video of a pivotal, pivotal moment in the story when DJ is arrested at the behest of his family. And this included audio of DJ talking to the officer about his desperate desire to stop using opioids. And we collected hundreds of text messages between several of the main characters that were exchanged during a pivotal two-day period in the story. And we used all of this to enrich and enhance our storytelling in the way in which the audience consumed it. All of these emerging technologies that relates to journalism are things not to be feared, but to be embraced. Just look at the work being done in data journalism and the ability we have to analyze large databases in unique and exciting ways. The story I mentioned earlier about the failed and segregated schools in Florida made use of statistical analysis and linear regression to show how all students in these schools were being impacted. And this kind of data work adds power and, and authority to, to investigative pieces and avoids the criticism that gets leveled oftentimes in these stories that it's just anecdotes. Similarly, last year, Reuters analyzed more than 14,000 Supreme Court records to show how just a few dozen lawyers with strong personal connections to the justices were stunningly successful in winning court review of their cases. I believe that today, the quality and quantity of investigative and long-form journalism is better than ever. And the promise of even greater and more impactful work is real. There's outstanding work being done by both new and traditional sources. Um, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Los Angeles Times, the Boston Globe, and I could go on, are doing incredible work. We have new models like uh, the nonprofit ProPublica, the Marshall Project and regional sites like the New England Center for Investigative Reporting and the Texas Tribune, which are delivering powerful work at the international, national, and regional level. And there are newer for-profit ventures doing excellent investigative work, including BuzzFeed. They're not all just about listicles. They do some amazing investigative work, and the same is true of the Huffington Post and others. And that's just in the US. There's terrific investigative reporting occur occurring around the world right now. So I'll end with this. For those of you considering a career in journalism, particularly some form of investigative journalism, 
I urge you to go for it. There are few jobs that offer the excitement, the challenge, and the satisfaction of the work we do. You can be part of a future that continues to enhance the value and popularity of investigative reporting, and also one that makes certain that investigative reporting does not suffer at the expense of stories about raccoon cats. Thank you. Oh, okay. Questions? Yes. So that's a good question. Matt Orr worked at the New York Times for many years, um, as does the head of our multimedia, um, Jeff Del Vicio, uh, was uh, at the New York Times as well. Um, one of our uh, multimedia folks is, I believe, one of Pat's former students, <laughs> a recent student too. Um, and then we, it's a mix. Um, some people come from non-traditional journalism backgrounds, you know, maybe in film or um, we have some incredible illustrators that do some really cool stuff. Um, so it's a really eclectic mix of people. Um, and we've made a big emphasis on multimedia. We have a disproportionately large multimedia team. And it's not to generate clickbait, um, you know, or, you know, things that'll go viral. It, it's, it's all about enhancing the journalism and making it better. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Yes. That's a really good question. I mean, at our, at STAT, we have a mix. Um, we have um, more seasoned journalists, um, <laughs> like myself and Charlie Piller, who's been doing this for a long time. And we have some journalists in their 20s, um, some of whom this is maybe their you know, first or second job who are doing investigative work for us. And really, I think that's all about the power of ideas. Rick Burke, who's our editor, um, and Gideon Gill, who's my editor and oversees enterprise and investigations, are both you know, veteran newspaper guys. Rick was you know, uh, one of the deputy bureau chiefs of the Washington Bureau of the New York Times and worked there, was a national editor, I think, too. And Gideon was at the Globe for a long time. And they just want ideas. And if you can execute on that, they don't care how old you are, where you came from you know, what your background is. So I think there's more opportunity that way than I think you're right, decades ago, you know, sort of you started out on the night cops beat, you know, or something like that and you worked your way up and it took longer. So I, I, I do think there's more opportunity. You mean as an individual to have yeah, all of those skills? Students, yes, students sure. I, I, I particularly think data skills um, are, are extremely important. Um, first of all, because they help you generate really good ideas for stories. And you know, we have um, some talented people who have PhDs. One's a Fulbright, Fulbright scholar. Um, you know, in sort of traditional, you know, computational backgrounds. Um, or, or statistics, and they're very helpful, but you know, you're thinking as a journalist. So to my mind, you want to be the one doing as much of the analysis as you can because that's how you come up with ideas. So I think that's a critical, I think every journalist should come into the field knowing how to be proficient in Excel, knowing um, some coding that allows for database analysis, um, or, and it could include using software like Access or things like that. I, I just think you, you have to have those skills if you're going to get into investigative reporting. Um, and even a lot of beat reporting, too, where that's essential. The video um, and illustration, a da data viz aspect of it, I think those are great skills to have. I, I, I think, you know, from my vantage point, they're not as important, not to say unimportant, but, um, and, and also a lot of people tend to kind of specialize in that. 
Yes. Um, personally or for, for no, staff? For staff. Well, and you yeah, <laughs> uh, well, they're sort of intertwined at this yeah. point. Um, y you know, we're, there's no real easy answer to that. I mean, we are, I, I think I'll say this, you know, we are a for-profit entity. I, I don't think I'll be giving away secrets if I say we're not making money yet. You know, we're still young. But at some point, we're going to have to make money and sustain ourselves if we're going to be successful. That inspires a lot of great journalism and ideas. That pressure is, you know, something that really gets you thinking about, you know, what do audiences want? What do they value? And I think that's where a lot of our best ideas come from. And, and I think that'll help us continue to grow and do better things. Um, that's not to say that nonprofits don't have pressures of their own, but you know, depending on the length of your grant and the size of it, it, it I think it's a different thing. Do medical companies, uh, even pharmaceuticals, support you? Because they want, you know... Yeah, I mean, pharma, the industry organization, is one of our advertisers. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, you know, we have some big pharma companies that are, I think we have 40 to 50 regular advertisers now. And they do include those companies. And, you know, inevitably, there'll be some conflict there. And I, there already has been. I mean, we've been, written stories have been very critical of some of Pharma's own members. But they see value in advertising on our site. Uh, Yeah, that's a really excellent question, and that was certainly an issue with Dope Sick. Um, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time in Ohio, Matt and I did, and we had to convince some participants in that story to be involved in our story, and they were hesitant. And part of that was getting them to trust us, so it, 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 it's a big responsibility. And I think the first thing you have to be, you have to be honest with people. You know, we're going to do a faithful rendering of what happened here. And you know what, some of that's pretty ugly. I mean, in our story, we talked about DJ stealing his younger sibling's Xboxes and pawning them so he could get heroin. You know, no family wants to see that. But they came around to the idea of telling the story of these two middle American kids who are best friends since the first day of kindergarten and how this went awry potentially having some benefit to other families and also helping to destigmatize it. But, but you know, you have to spend a lot of time with these people to get them to trust you. Um, and, and again, the way, the best thing I find is to be honest. Um, and it was the same, the same thing with A.J. Long, um, who was the quarterback from Syracuse that we profiled. He was hesitant, very hesitant. And um, his father talked him into it. And, and part of that was I spent a lot of time with his father and getting to know him. He was a big influence on his son. Um, and in the end, he was very happy with what we did. We, he thought we were very fair to him. And he's playing, he's actually playing, well, he was playing football this year, and I just texted with him the other day, and he got hurt again. Um, so um, you have to spend a lot of time with people, be honest with them, and, and I think that's the recipe for getting subjects to cooperate in these long-term stories. Yeah, I was with them uh, that day too. Um, so we spent, you know, we didn't spend every day on that story, but this went for a couple of months. You know, the, the, the dope sick story is much more intensive in terms of the reporting. Um, but we would check in with AJ, we'd go up to Syracuse and see him. Um, and we didn't know how the story was going to turn out. When we first published it, he was being recruited by about a dozen schools. And the, the physician at uh, on the Syracuse football team had medically disqualified him. He could not play any contact sport at that school ever again. And this happens at lots of schools. And there's no rhyme or reason. I mean, AJ had three concussions. I talked to the University of Arizona trainer who said he let a kid with 10 concussions keep playing. S and, and that was part of our story. Um, so um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it takes time, and um, we, we've, we've got the benefit of that because our editors are supportive of the work. Yes? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I did see something, and I don't remember the details about this. Uh, it'll come to me, but somebody did it. Oh, it's about the Washington Post stories about police shootings and um, reforms that resulted from that. And some academic did a study showing how much money that saved, you know, because of fewer lawsuits, fewer lost time for police officers who get you know, put on death duty after shootings, because shootings went down after their stories and there were reforms put in place. And that was a really, I might not have all those details exactly right, but it was along that lines. I thought that was fascinating. I'd never seen that. Usually all, the only things we see about that regard are how expensive our stories are to produce. Mm -hmm. So it was nice to see uh, a societal benefit described in a different way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think we need to do more to to let people know that these stories have impact when they do. So, you know, sometimes they don't. You know, sometimes we write and people just learn something. Um, but oftentimes they, they do have impact. And, you know, we do follow up stories and things like that. But I kind of like your idea of kind of chronicling the, the, the benefits that come and result from these stories. I don't know of anyone that does that in sort of any organized, centralized way. I haven't seen it, so I was wondering if you could yeah. about it. Yeah, but you know we have common ownership, but we're completely distinct, and um, you know in budgetary ways, er, every way imaginable. It, it was a leap of faith for me, and frankly, um, it's been invigorating. I mean, I, I I whistle on the way to work, or sing sometimes, but um, <laughs> that's probably more than you need to know. But uh, I, I, it's so liberating to work at a place where there's a ton of energy. There's no entrenched bureaucracy or turf, which it, some of these big organizations I've worked at is soul-sucking um, and, and, and deprives you of so much time and energy. It's all about the journalism and, and how can we do you know, the best, most provocative, important journalism that we can do. Um, and, and it's been wonderful. I mean, will it, will it be here in five years? I can't promise you that. I, I don't know. I hope so. I, you know, I think journalistically we're making it work. We have really smart business people on the business side of it trying to make it work that way. Um, but, you know, I might be looking for something else. I just don't know. But so far it's been terrific. I don't know if I can think of a particular example off the top of my head to be, to be candid. Um, I, I've been unsuccessful in reporting and actually not getting the story published. You know, sometimes you just don't get there and, and people can be very creative and inventive in trying to block you. Um, usually people of influence and money. Um, so, I mean, you know, I remember one case where we were really desperately trying to get this deposition that we knew had the elements of the story in it that would, were a legal document that would help us and allow us to write this story. And we couldn't get it. They had it sealed. Um, we tried everybody in the case. Nobody would give us the document. And then um, one of the lawyers said to me, have you tried calling the um, court reporter? Because, you know, court reporters love, they charge a buck a page for these things, and they, they pretty much sell them to anybody. And um, I called the, the court reporter, you know, the transcriber, and had it, like, within an hour by email. Now, it cost a couple of hundred bucks, but we had our story. Um, so that was sort of a unique workaround. I've tried that several times since. I'd say I'm 50-50. <laughs> So, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, that happens. I can't think of any wonderful anecdote, uh, successful story. You just kind of keep plugging away and hoping that you can get oh, at it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, 
Um, well, look, you know, generally speaking, one of the reasons I took the job is because um, health and medicine are at the intersection of life and death, Wall Street, you know, billions and billions of dollars being spent. So obviously, and we're already talking about ideas um, for the future, but you know, the amount of money we're spending on healthcare is, is not declining. And um, examining that in a critical way is really a fertile area, um, especially, with, especially with the debate about Obamacare and how we're going to do that going forward. Um, and then, you know, we also do a lot on scientific discovery. Um, and, and that's fertile area to, uh, as well. And there's fascinating things there, like, you know, the, I don't know if you know what CRISPR is, I barely understand it myself, but we have very smart people at STAT that do. But there's this incredible fight about who actually discovered this technology. And, and the egos and the battling that's going on just makes for phenomenal reading. Um, so, you know, those are areas we'll look at as well, because frankly, there's um, a lot of money to be made off discoveries in academia and other places as well. So that's a really fertile area as well. Anything else? Everyone tired after a long day? <laughs> I think we want to just, uh, David, thank you so much for yeah, coming. Thank Thanks you. to all of you.